Part Three of The Murders in the Rue Morgue by Edgar Allan Poe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Three. The riddle so far was now unriddled. The assassin had escaped through the window which looked upon the bed. Dropping of its own accord upon his exit, or perhaps purposely closed, it had become fastened by the spring, and it was the retention of this spring which had been mistaken by the police for that of the nail, farther inquiry being thus considered unnecessary. The next question was that of the mode of descent. Upon this point I had been satisfied in my walk with you around the building. About five feet and a half from the casement in question there runs a lightning rod. From this rod it would have been impossible for any one to reach the window itself, to say nothing of entering it. I observed, however, that the shutters of the fourth story were of the peculiar kind called by Parisian carpenters ferrades, a kind rarely employed at the present day, but frequently seen upon very old mansions in Lyon and Bordeaux. They are in the form of an ordinary door, a single, not a folding door, except that the lower half is latticed, or worked in open trellis, thus affording an excellent hold for the hands. In the present instance, these shutters are fully three feet and a half broad. When we saw them from the rear of the house, they were both about half open, that is to say, they stood off at right angles from the wall. It is probable that the police, as well as myself, examined the back of the tenement, but if so, in looking at these ferrades in the line of their breath, as they must have done, they did not perceive this great breath itself, or at all events, failed to take it into due consideration. In fact, having once satisfied themselves that no egress could have been made in this quarter, they would naturally bestow here a very cursory examination. It was clear to me, however, that the shutter belonging to the window at the head of the bed would, if swung fully back to the wall, reach to within two feet of the lightning rod. It was also evident that, by exertion of a very unusual degree of activity and courage, an entrance into the window from the rod might have been thus effected. By reaching to the distance of two feet and a half, we now suppose the shutter open to its whole extent, a robber might have taken a firm grasp upon the trellis work. Letting go, then, his hold upon the rod, placing his feet securely against the rod and springing boldly from it, he might have swung the shutter so as to close it, and, if we imagine the window open at the time, might even have swung himself into the room. I wish you to bear especially in mind that I have spoken of a very unusual degree of activity as requisite to success in so hazardous and so difficult a feat. It is my design to show you, first, that the thing might possibly have been accomplished, but secondly and chiefly, I wish to impress upon your understanding the very extraordinary, the almost preternatural character of that agility which would have accomplished it. You will say, no doubt, using the language of the law, that, to make out my case, I should rather undervalue than insist upon a full estimation of the activity required in this matter. This may be the practice in law, but it is not the usage of reason. My ultimate object is only the truth. My immediate purpose is to lead you to place in juxtaposition that very unusual activity of which I have just spoken, with that very peculiar, shrill, or harsh and unequal voice, about whose nationality no two persons could be found to agree, and in whose utterance no syllabification could be detected. At these words a vague and half-formed conception of the meaning of Dupin flitted over my mind. I seemed to be upon the verge of comprehension without power to comprehend. Men at times find themselves upon the brink of remembrance without being able in the end to remember. My friend went on with his discourse. "'You will see,' he said, 
that I have shifted the question from the mode of egress to that of ingress. It was my design to convey the idea that both were effected in the same manner at the same point. Let us now revert to the interior of the room. Let us survey the appearances here. The drawers of the bureau, it is said, have been rifled, although many articles of apparel still remain within them. The conclusion here is absurd. It is a mere guess, a very silly one, and no more. How are we to know that the articles found in the drawer were not all these drawers had originally contained? Madame Lespane and her daughter lived an exceedingly retired life, saw no company, seldom went out, and had little use for numerous changes of hebblement. Those found were at least of as good quality as any likely to be possessed by these ladies. If a thief had taken any, why did he not take the best? Why did he not take them all? In a word, why did he abandon four thousand francs in gold to encumber himself with a bundle of linen? The gold was abandoned. Nearly the whole sum mentioned by M. Mignot, the banker, was discovered in bags upon the floor. I wish you, therefore, to discard from your thoughts the blundering idea of motive engendered in the brains of the police by that portion of the evidence which speaks of money delivered at the door of the house. Coincidences ten times as remarkable as this the delivery of the money and murder committed within three days upon the party receiving it, happened to all of us every hour of our lives, without attracting even momentary notice. Coincidences, in general, are great stumbling-blocks in the way of that class of thinkers who have been educated to know nothing of the theory of probabilities, that theory to which the most glorious objects of human research are indebted for the most glorious of illustration. In the present instance, had the gold been gone, the fact of its delivery three days before would have formed something more than a coincidence. It would have been corroborative of this idea of motive. But under the real circumstances of the case, if we are to suppose gold the motive of this outrage, we must also imagine the perpetrator so vacillating an idiot as to have abandoned his gold and his motive altogether. Keeping now steadily in mind the points to which I have drawn your attention, that peculiar voice, that unusual agility, and that startling absence of motive in a murder so singularly atrocious as this, let us glance at the butchery itself. Here is a woman strangled to death by manual strength, and thrust up a chimney head downward. Ordinary assassins employ no such modes of murder as this. Least of all do they thus dispose of the murdered. In the manner of thrusting the corpse up the chimney, you will admit that there was something excessively outre, something altogether irreconcilable with our common notions of human action, even when we suppose the actors the most depraved of men. Think, too, how great must have been that strength which could have thrust the body up such an aperture so forcibly that the united vigor of several persons was found barely sufficient to drag it down. Turn now to other indications of the employment of a vigor most marvelous. On the hearth were thick tresses, very thick tresses, of gray human hair. These had been torn out by the roots. You are aware of the great force necessary in tearing thus from the head even twenty or thirty hairs together. You saw the locks in question as well as myself. Their roots, a hideous sight, were clotted with fragments of the flesh of the scalp, sure token of the prodigious power which had been exerted in uprooting perhaps half a million of hairs at a time. The throat of the old lady was not merely cut, but the head absolutely severed from the body. The instrument was a mere razor. I wish you also to look at the brutal ferocity of these deeds. Of the bruises upon the body of Madame Lespanet I do not speak. 
Monsieur Dumas and his worthy coadjutor, Monsieur Etienne, have pronounced that they were inflicted by some obtuse instrument, and so far these gentlemen are very correct. The obtuse instrument was clearly the stone pavement in the yard, upon which the victim had fallen from the window which looked in upon the bed. This idea, however simple it may now seem, escaped the police for the same reason that the breath of the shutters escaped them, because, by the affair of the nails, their perceptions had been hermetically sealed against the possibility of the windows having ever been opened at all. If now, in addition to all these things, you have properly reflected upon the odd disorder of the chamber, we have gone so far as to combine the ideas of an agility astounding, a strength superhuman, a ferocity brutal, a butchery without motive, a grotesquerie in horror absolutely alien from humanity, and a voice foreign in tone to the ears of men of many nations, and devoid of all distinct or intelligible syllabification. What result, then, has ensued? What impression have I made upon your fancy? I felt a creeping of the flesh as Dupin asked me the question. A madman, I said, has done this deed. Some raving maniac escaped from a neighboring maison de sante. In some respects, he replied, your idea is not irrelevant. But— the voices of madmen, even in their wildest paroxysms, are never found to tally with that peculiar voice heard upon the stairs. Madmen are of some nation, and their language, however incoherent its words, has always the coherence of syllabification. Besides, the hair of a madman is not such as I now hold in my hand. I disentangled this little tuft from the rigidly clutched fingers of Madame L'Espanay. Tell me what you can make of it. Dupin, I said, completely unnerved. This hair is most unusual. This is no human hair. I have not asserted that it is, said he. But before we decide the point, I wish you to glance at the little sketch I have here traced upon this paper. It is a facsimile drawing of what has been described in one portion of the testimony as dark bruises and deep indentations of fingernails upon the throat of Mademoiselle L'Espanay, and in another, by Messrs. Dumas and Etienne, as a series of livid spots, evidently the impression of fingers. You will perceive, continued my friend, spreading out the paper upon the table before us, that this drawing gives the idea of a firm and fixed hold. There is no slipping apparent. Each finger has retained, possibly until the death of the victim, the fearful grasp by which it originally embedded itself. Attempt now to place all your fingers at the same time in the respective impressions as you see them. I made the attempt in vain. We are possibly not giving this matter a fair trial, he said. The paper is spread out upon a plain surface, but the human throat is cylindrical. Here is a billet of wood, the circumference of which is about that of the throat. Wrap the drawing around it, and try the experiment again. I did so, but the difficulty was even more obvious than before. This, I said, is the mark of no human hand. Read now, replied Dupin, this passage from Cuvier. It was a minute anatomical and generally descriptive account of the large fulvous orangutan of the East Indian Islands. The gigantic stature, the prodigious strength and activity, the wild ferocity, and the imitative propensities of these mammalia are sufficiently well known to all. I understood the full horrors of the murder at once. 
The description of the digits, said I, as I made an end of reading, is in exact accordance with this drawing. I see that no animal but an orangutan of the species here mentioned could have impressed the indentations as you have traced them. This tuft of tawny hair, too, is identical in character with that of the beast of Cuvier. But I cannot possibly comprehend the particulars of this frightful mystery. Besides, there were two voices heard in contention, and one of them was unquestionably the voice of a Frenchman. True, and you will remember an expression attributed almost unanimously by the evidence to this voice, the expression, Mon Dieu. This, under the circumstances, has been justly characterized by one of the witnesses, Montani, the confectioner, as an expression of remonstrance or expostulation. Upon these two words, therefore, I have mainly built my hopes of a full solution of the riddle. A Frenchman was cognizant of the murder. It is possible, indeed it is far more than probable, that he was innocent of all participation in the bloody transactions which took place. The orangutan may have escaped from him. He may have traced it to the chamber, but under the agitating circumstances which ensued, he could never have recaptured it. It is still at large. I will not pursue these guesses, for I have no right to call them more, since the shades of reflection upon which they are based are scarcely of sufficient depth to be appreciable to my own intellect, and since I could not pretend to make them intelligible to the understanding of another. We will call them guesses, then, and speak of them as such. If the Frenchman in question is indeed, as I suppose, innocent of this atrocity, this advertisement which I left last night upon our return home at the office of Le Mans, a paper devoted to the shipping interest and much sought by sailors, will bring him to our residence. He handed me a paper, and I read thus. Caught in the Bois de Boulogne early in the morning of the instant, the morning of the murder, a very large tawny orangutan of the Bornese species. The owner, who is ascertained to be a sailor belonging to a Maltese vessel, may have the animal again upon identifying it satisfactorily, and paying a few charges arising from its capture and keeping. Call at number blank, rue blank, Forburg saint germain Utrosium. How is it possible, I asked, that you should know the man to be a sailor, and belonging to a Maltese vessel? I do not know it, said Dupin. I am not sure of it. Here, however, is a small piece of ribbon, which from its form and from its greasy appearance, has evidently been used in tying the hair in one of those long queues of which sailors are so fond. Moreover, this knot is one which few besides sailors can tie, and is peculiar to the Maltese. I picked the ribbon up at the foot of the lightning rod. It could not have belonged to either of the deceased. Now, if, after all, I am wrong in my induction from this ribbon, that the Frenchman was a sailor belonging to a Maltese vessel, still I can have done no harm in saying what I did in the advertisement. If I am in error, he will merely suppose that I have been misled by some circumstance into which he will not take the trouble to inquire. But, if I am right, a great point is gained. Cognizant, although innocent of the murder, the Frenchman will naturally hesitate about replying to the advertisement, about demanding the orangutan. He will reason thus. I am innocent. I am poor. My orangutan is of great value, to one of my circumstances a fortune of itself. Why should I lose it through the apprehensions of danger? Here it is within my grasp. It was found in the Bois de Boulogne, at a vast distance from the scene of that butchery. How can it ever be suspected that a brute beast should have done the deed? The police are at fault. They have failed to procure the slightest clue. Should they even trace the animal, 
it would be impossible to prove me cognizant of the murder, or to implicate me in guilt on account of that cognizance. Above all, I am known. The advertiser designates me as the possessor of the beast. I am not sure to what limit his knowledge may extend. Should I avoid claiming a property of so great value which it is known that I possess, I will render the animal at least liable to suspicion. It is not my policy to attract attention either to myself or to the beast. I will answer the advertisement, get the orangutan, and keep it close until this matter has blown over. At this moment we heard a step upon the stairs. Be ready, said Dupin, with your pistols, but neither use them nor show them until at a signal from myself. The front door of the house had been left open, and the visitor had entered without ringing and advanced several steps upon the staircase. Now, however, he seemed to hesitate. Presently we heard him descending. Dupin was moving quickly to the door when we again heard him coming up. He did not turn back a second time, but stepped up with decision and rapped at the door of our chamber. "'Come in!' said Dupin, a cheerful and hearty tone. A man entered. He was a sailor, evidently, a tall, stout, and muscular-looking person, with a certain daredevil expression of countenance, not altogether unprepossessing. His face, greatly sunburnt, was more than half hidden by whiskers and mustachio. He had with him a huge oaken cudgel, but appeared to be otherwise unarmed, he bowed awkwardly and bade us good evening in French accents, which, although somewhat neuchoftelish, were still sufficiently indicative of a Parisian origin. "'Sit down, my friend,' said Dupin. "'I suppose you have called about the orangutan. Upon my word, I almost envy you the possession of him, a remarkably fine, and no doubt a very valuable animal. How old do you suppose him to be?' The sailor drew a long breath with the air of a man relieved of some intolerable burden, and then replied in an assured tone, "'I have no way of telling, but he can't be more than four or five years old. Have you got him here?' "'Oh, no, we had no conveniences for keeping him here. He is at a livery stable in the Rue du Bourg, just by. You can get him in the morning.' Of course you are prepared to identify the property? To be sure I am, sir. I shall be sorry to part with him, said Dupin. I don't mean that you should be at all this trouble for nothing, sir, said the man. Couldn't expect it. Am very willing to pay a reward for the finding of the animal, that is to say, anything in reason. Well, replied my friend, that is all very fair to be sure. Let me think. What should I have? Oh, I will tell you. My reward shall be this. You shall give me all the information in your power about these murders in the Rue Morgue. Dupin said the last words in a very low tone and very quietly. Just as quietly, too, he walked toward the door, locked it, and put the key in his pocket. He then drew a pistol from his bosom and placed it without the least flurry upon the table. The sailor's face flushed up as if he were struggling with suffocation. He started to his feet and grasped his cudgel, but the next moment he fell back into his seat, trembling violently, and with the countenance of death itself. He spoke not a word. I pitied him from the bottom of my heart. "'My friend,' said Dupin, in a kind tone, "'you are alarming yourself unnecessarily. "'You are indeed. "'We mean you no harm whatever. "'I pledge you the honor of a gentleman and of a Frenchman "'that we intend you no injury. "'I perfectly well know that you are innocent "'of the atrocities in the Rue Morgue. "'It will not do, however, to deny that you are "'in some measure implicated in them.' From what I have already said, you must know that I have had means of information about this matter, means of which you could never have dreamed. Now, the thing stands thus. 
You have done nothing which you could have avoided, nothing, certainly, which renders you culpable. You were not even guilty of robbery, when you might have robbed with impunity. You have nothing to conceal. You have no reason for concealment. On the other hand, you are bound by every principle of honor to confess all you know. An innocent man is now imprisoned, charged with that crime of which you can point out the perpetrator. The sailor had recovered his presence of mind, in a great measure, while Dupin uttered these words, but his original boldness of bearing was all gone. "'So help me God,' said he, after a brief pause. "'I will tell you all I know about this affair, but I do not expect you to believe one half I say. I would be a fool indeed if I did. Still, I am innocent, and I will make a clean breast if I die for it.' What he stated was, in substance, this. He had lately made a voyage to the Indian archipelago. A party, of which he formed one, landed at Borneo, and passed into the interior on an excursion of pleasure. Himself and a companion had captured the orangutan. This companion dying, the animal fell into his own exclusive possession. After great trouble, occasioned by the intractable ferocity of his captive during the home voyage, he at length succeeded in lodging it safely at his own residence in Paris, where, not to attract toward himself the unpleasant curiosity of his neighbors, he kept it carefully secluded, until such time as it should recover from a wound in the foot, received from a splinter on board ship. His ultimate design was to sell it. Returning home from some sailor's frolic the night, or rather the morning of the murder, he found the beast occupying his own bedroom, into which it had broken from a closet adjoining, where it had been, as was thought, securely confined. Razor in hand and fully lathered, it was sitting before a looking-glass, attempting the operation of shaving in which it had no doubt previously watched its master through the keyhole of the closet. Terrified at the sight of so dangerous a weapon in the possession of an animal so ferocious and so well able to use it, the man, for some moments, was at a loss what to do. He had been accustomed, however, to quiet the creature, even in its fiercest moods, by the use of a whip, and to this he now resorted. Upon sight of it, the orangutan sprang at once through the door of the chamber, down the stairs, and thence through a window unfortunately open into the street. The Frenchman followed in despair, the ape, razor in hand, occasionally stopping to look back and gesticulate at its pursuer, until the latter had nearly come up to it. It then again made off. In this manner the chase continued for a long time. The streets were profoundly quiet, as it was nearly three o'clock in the morning. In passing down an alley in the rear of the Rue Morgue, the fugitive's attention was arrested by a light gleaming from the open window of Madame Lespanet's chamber in the fourth story of her house. Rushing to the building, it perceived the lightning rod, clambered up with inconceivable agility, grasped the shutter which was thrown fully back against the wall, and by its means swung itself directly upon the headboard of the bed. The whole feat did not occupy a minute. The shutter was kicked open again by the orangutan as it entered the room. The sailor, in the meantime, was both rejoiced and perplexed. He had strong hopes now of recapturing the brute, as it could scarcely escape from the trap into which it had ventured, except by the rod, where it might be intercepted as it came down. On the other hand, there was much cause for anxiety as to what it might do in the house. This latter reflection urged the man still to follow the fugitive. A lightning rod is ascended without difficulty, especially by a sailor, but when he had arrived as high as the window, which lay far to his left, his career was stopped. The most that he could accomplish was to reach over so as to obtain a glimpse of the interior of the room. At this glimpse 
he nearly fell from his hold through excess of horror. Now it was that those hideous shrieks arose upon the night, which had startled from slumber the inmates of the Rue Morgue. Madame L'Espanay and her daughter, habited in their night clothes, had apparently been occupied in arranging some papers in the iron chest already mentioned, which had been wheeled into the middle of the room. It was open, and its contents lay beside it on the floor. The victims must have been sitting with their backs toward the window, and from the time elapsing between the ingress of the beast and the screams, it seems probable that it was not immediately perceived. The flapping to of the shutter would naturally have been attributed to the wind. As the sailor looked in, the gigantic animal had seized Madame L'Espanier by the hair, which was loose as she had been combing it, and was flourishing the razor about her face, in imitation of the motions of a barber. The daughter lay prostrate and motionless, she had swooned. The screams and struggles of the old lady, during which the hair was torn from her head, had the effect of changing the probably pacific purposes of the orangutan into those of wrath. With one determined sweep of its muscular arm, it nearly severed her head from her body. The sight of blood inflamed its anger into frenzy. Gnashing its teeth and flashing fire from its eyes, it flew upon the body of the girl and embedded its fearful talons in her throat, retaining its grasp until she expired. Its wandering and wild glances fell at this moment upon the head of the bed, over which the face of its master, rigid with horror, was just discernible. The fury of the beast, who no doubt bore still in mind the dreaded whip, was instantly converted into fear. Conscious of having deserved punishment, it seemed desirous of concealing its bloody deeds, and skipped about the chamber in an agony of nervous agitation, throwing down and breaking the furniture as it moved, and dragging the bed from the bedstead. In conclusion, it seized first the corpse of the daughter and thrust it up the chimney, as it was found, then that of the old lady, which it immediately hurled through the window headlong. As the ape approached the casement with its mutilated burden, the sailor shrank aghast to the rod, and, rather gliding than clambering down it, hurried at once home, dreading the consequences of the butchery, and gladly abandoning, in his terror, all solicitude about the fate of the orangutan. The words heard by the party upon the staircase were the Frenchman's exclamations of horror and affright, commingled with the fiendish jabberings of the brute. I have scarcely anything to add. The orangutan must have escaped from the chamber, by the rod, just before the break of the door. It must have closed the window as it passed through it. It was subsequently caught by the owner himself, who obtained for it a very large sum at the Chardin des Plantes. Le Don was instantly released, upon our narration of the circumstances, with some comments from Dupin, at the bureau of the prefect of police. This functionary, however well disposed to my friend, could not altogether conceal his chagrin at the turn which affairs had taken, and was fain to indulge in a sarcasm or two about the propriety of every person minding his own business. "'Let him talk,' said Dupin, who had not thought it necessary to reply. "'Let him discourse. It will ease his conscience. I am satisfied with having defeated him in his own castle.' Nevertheless, that he failed in the solution of this mystery is by no means that matter for wonder which he supposes it, for in truth our friend the prefect is somewhat too cunning to be profound. In his wisdom is no stamen. It is all head and no body, like the pictures of the goddess Laverna, or at best all head and shoulders like a codfish. But he is a good creature, after all. I like him, especially for one master stroke of cant, by which he has attained his reputation for ingenuity. 
I mean, the way he has de nir que sien et d'expliquer ce qui n'est pas. End of Part 3 End of The Murders in the Rue Morgue by Edgar Allan Poe